Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I would love to see more of you. I very much miss you, but, but I'm honored that you're joining us this way. I want to let you know that we are electing officers following our in-person worship service today. Afterwards, I'll send out an email and let you know who all the, the new officers are. Well, I want to call us to worship today by reading Psalm 63, verses 1 through 4. Join with me and follow along. Psalm 63, verses 1 to 4. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Let's pray together. Lord, we come seeking after you. We thirst for you. We long for you. We come to worship and adore you. We lift up our voices to you and worship. And we pray that you will be glorified. We pray you will be honored. Lord, where we have fallen short of your glory, we ask that you would forgive us. Lord, the injustice, the violence, the vile words often used by politicians are horrible. And we need healing in all these areas and many more. Those sorts of things are, are getting a lot of press right now, Lord, so it's easy for us to see those things and to point fingers. But Lord, we fail to see that the inclinations of our own hearts can be just as ugly. So bring great healing to our land and may it begin with us. Lord, heal those who are physically hurting today. Heal those who are anxious. Heal those who are grieving. Lord, heal relationships in our homes, in our businesses, in our schools, our communities, and our churches. Lord, help us see where we've hurt another person and give us the courage to make it right. Lord, move us out of our comfort zones and make us your agents of healing. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we are looking today at Nehemiah 2. And last week, uh, we saw that Nehemiah had turned to the Lord in prayer before he did anything else. Nehemiah was a great leader, but he knew that he needed God's help, so he turned to him in prayer. Remember that for at least four months uh, he had prayed because four months had passed between the beginning of chapter one when Nehemiah learned of the broken walls of Jerusalem and the beginning of chapter two where Nehemiah finally got his chance to present his request to King Artaxerxes. And all indications are that ne Nehemiah persistently prayed during that time. Nehemiah's plan was to rebuild the broken down walls surrounding Jerusalem, but he knew that he needed the king's permission to do so. And so he prayed that God would give him favor with the king. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, God answered Nehemiah's prayer through an encounter Nehemiah had with the king in the course of his regular duties. But I believe this was no coincidence. It was a divine appointment. 
provided because Nehemiah persistently prayed. Listen to that meeting between Nehemiah and King Artaxerxes in Nehemiah 2, uh, verses 1 through 8. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servants has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Amen. The first thing I see about leadership in chapter 2 of Nehemiah is that this leader, Nehemiah, knows his goal. He sought after God in prayer for at least four months. And he seems to be very clear that God has called him to lead the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. He lets the king know that he's sad because the city and its gates have been destroyed and he wants the king to let him rebuild them. God has called Nehemiah and he's committed to that goal even though it requires risk. Yes, make no mistake, Nehemiah was doing some very risky business here. But when godly leaders are sure of God's call, they take the next step of faith. Sure, they count the cost. They understand the risk. They don't go about these risks haphazardly. In fact, sometimes it's a very calculated risk. But when godly leaders are sure God is calling they take a leap of faith. Now, what were the risks for Nehemiah? Well, notice in verse 2 that the king asked, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then says Nehemiah, I was very much afraid. Why was he afraid? Well, first of all, because those serving a king were expected to be cheerful and certainly not despondent. In the book of Esther chapter 4, Mordecai learns of the plot to destroy the Jews and he tore his clothes and it says he put on sackcloth, which was a sign of sadness and mourning. And then Mordecai was so upset that he went out into the city and, and there he was crying loudly and bitterly. But verse 2 of Esther 4 tells us that Mordecai only went as far as the entrance to the king's gate. For no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Why? Because no one was allowed to be sad in front of a Persian king. So back to Nehemiah. He is first at risk, you see, by letting down his guard and being sad before the king. 
But the greater risk was the fact that he was questioning the king. It's always dangerous to question a king. But the danger was elevated in this case. You see, in order to fully understand the book of Nehemiah, you've got to also read the book of Ezra. In fact, some scholars believe that they were originally one book. Regardless, if you read Ezra chapter 4, you will find that King Artaxerxes had earlier forbidden the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its walls. Artaxerxes had actually been tricked into making this decree by some of the Jews' adversaries. But nevertheless, he had made a decree that the work would cease in rebuilding the city and its walls until he decreed otherwise. People in power, particularly dictators, don't like to have their orders questioned. But enter Nehemiah, who asks that the king reverse his decree and let Nehemiah return and rebuild the wall. Commentator James Boyce says that Persian kings were known for their cruelty. And since their oppressive policies were actually resented by those they ruled, they were almost always in danger of assassination or revolt. So they were really suspicious of any wrong moves or any apparent lack of loyalty by their subordinates. So you see, Nehemiah had every reason to be very much afraid. Not only was he sad before the king, but he was asking the king to reverse his own orders. However, Nehemiah stayed the course. He knew the cost. In this case, it could cost him his life. But he was convinced that God was calling him to rebuild the wall. And so he took the risk. And that's what godly leaders do. Nehemiah was operating way out of his comfort zone. You see, it would have been easier for him to just keep serving as the king's cupbearer. Yes, being a cupbearer is risky. Taking the king's wine and, and making sure it's safe to drink was risky business. But he had been doing it a while, and I'm sure he had a system for making sure that he and the king were safe. So why step out of his comfort zone? Because he knew God was calling him to do so. Folks, leaders step out of their comfort zones when God is calling. Last week, I quoted Vince Lombardi, and this week I want to give another a football illustration. I apologize for football illustrations back to back. Uh, when I was in seminary, we were told to not use uh, too many sports illustrations because some people uh, don't like sports. And, and personally, I'm becoming less and less a sports fan myself, but that's another story. But this illustration fits very well. I read this illustration in O.S. Hawkins, The Nehemiah Code, and I abbreviate and, and paraphrase his narrative. When we think of the modern era of football, we often think of, of great quarterbacks. I won't name any because we would surely disagree on who are the great ones. But when we think of strong football teams, yes, we think of defenses and we say things like defense wins championships and it probably does. But still, when we, when we think of football, Quarterbacks often come to mind, particularly quarterbacks who are very proficient at throwing the ball. But that hasn't always been the case. Back in the day, games were low-scoring affairs. They were fought down in the trenches with running and tackling. Guys wearing only leather helmets flung their bodies through the air, running and blocking and, and things that they called flying wedges. It was a few hard fault yards and a cloud of dust. But then something happened. Back in 1906, the forward pass was legalized. But during that first season, few teams utilized it. They, they stayed within their comfort zones between the tackles. In fact, the late coach at the University of Texas, Darrell Royal, is famous for saying, 
Four things can happen when you throw the football and three of them are bad. You can complete the pass, but the quarterback can also be tackled for a loss. You can throw an incomplete pass or worse yet, you can throw an interception. By the way, I've read where Royal actually said three things can happen and two of them are bad. But either way, you get the point. It's risky business. Throwing the ball can be risky and in its infancy, teams were unwilling to take that risk. But St. Louis University became one of the first to move out of their comfort zone. They switched almost entirely to the forward pass. In that first season, they outscored their opponents 402 to 11. 402 to 11. The rest, they say, is football history. Church, what I'm about to say is honestly much easier for me to say than it is for me to do sometimes. But if we're going to lead the church, we must step out of our comfort zones. The most fatal words of a church are, we've never done it that way before. I had never uploaded video or tried some of the silly things I've done on the children's messages. And I still don't fully know what I'm doing. But I knew I had to try something because we needed to be nourished with the Word of God during the coronavirus shutdown. In fact, we needed it then more than ever. So I stepped out of my comfort zone. And we're reaching people that we might not otherwise reach. So when we go back to full uh, in-person services, we're going to need to better utilize social media. In video, and that may once again take some of us out of our comfort zones. And listen, folks, I share that as a very simple example. And I know that God's calling for our church and for you personally might require a much bigger leap out of your comfort zone. But I can tell you this some days I'm still that kid I spoke of in today's children's message. The words, I can't, still rise to the surface. So I promise you that if I can step out of my comfort zone, so can you. Pastor Craig Greshel wrote a book titled It. And he writes in this book about churches that have it. That is, they have that something extra special. And as I read that book, I realized uh, that ultimately that something Special is actually someone. I believe those churches who have it are filled with the Holy Spirit and they love Jesus and they want to serve and glorify Him more than anything else. But according to Gresham, one of the characteristics of those churches is that they're innovators. They're willing to try something new. Now they don't do new things just to do new things, but they seek to make improvements by trying some new things. And Gresham, I believe, rightly points out that when we do that, that means we've got to be willing to risk failing. Robert Kennedy once said, only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. My friends, I don't like to fail. When I fail, I second guess myself. Maybe, I think maybe I didn't hear God right on this. Or maybe I don't have what it takes. Maybe I have no business being in ministry. But I think we need to fight against being hesitant leaders. Yes, we want to be prayerful and wise, and we always want to consider the cause we must discern between faith and foolishness. But we must move out of our comfort zones if we're going to serve the Lord and we're going to be godly leaders in His church. John Ortberg's book, I believe, says it all. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. And we've got to understand that it's okay to have some fear. 
Ortberg says fear and growth go together like macaroni and cheese. But if we don't get out of the boat, there is a guaranteed certainty that we'll never walk on water. Larry Lawden, a philosopher of science, says that the first principle of risk management is very simple. Everything is risky. He said you can stay home in bed, but that may make you one of the half million Americans who require emergency room treatment each year for injuries sustained while falling out of bed. Nehemiah knew the risk, and our text is clear that he was very much afraid. But what did he do when the opportunity to answer his call was given to him? Verse 4 says, So I prayed to the God of heaven. He had been praying at least four months, and now the answer to his prayer had come. God had, was calling him to take a risk. It was time to get out of the boat. So he prayed another quick prayer and he presented his request to the king. And the rest is history. Verse 8. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of God was upon me. Stuart Presbyterian leaders, what is God calling us to? Does he want us to better utilize technology and social media? Are there more ways he, he's calling us to get out of the boat, to get out of these four walls and serve and reach our community? Does he want us to press forward and really grow our youth and children's ministries? How is God calling us to fulfill our mission to know Jesus Christ and to make him known? There will be risk, and we must count the cost. We mu must discern what is faithful versus what is foolish. But bathing our calling in prayer, we must step out of our comfort zones. And if we are faithful, the good hand of our God will be upon us. Let's pray together. Lord, where we have been weak and fearful to answer your call, forgive us. Oh Lord, empower your church that we might step out in faith. Oh Lord, empower your church that, that we might love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that we might love our neighbors as ourselves. Oh Lord, give us great love for those around us and fill us with a deep compassion for the lost. And Lord, that's going to require moving out of our comfort zones. So move us. Move us that we might reach out to those who do not know you. Move us to step out of our comfort zone, to get out of the boat, and to answer your call, whatever it is. Move us to answer your call to truly know Jesus Christ and to make him known. In Christ's holy name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen. Church, let us go out. Let us step out of the boat. Let us move out of our comfort zones. And let us indeed know Jesus Christ and make him known. God bless you, church. Goodbye.